Is this mic on? Yeah, I guess I can hear it. Well, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me, and thank you for your spare computer. <laughs> all right, so what I'm going to talk about is latent variable alt model. And this is, a, as it indicates, a framework for longitudinal data analysis. And this is a co-authored paper. And this is an outline of what I'd like to go over. First, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about the, the general model, um, how initial conditions are an issue to uh, examine here and two different approaches to it, identification issue. And by identification, this is a question of whether it's even possible with population information to find the parameters of this model. And then uh, multivariate extensions of it. And then um, just take a little bit of time to show how we can go from this general model to a lot of special cases of this model. And finally, we'll look at an empirical example. Um, to, to start off, I would describe that uh, we've transitioned in the social behavioral and health sciences to a situation where we were you know, longing to have these longitudinal data sets. And what I mean by the longitudinal, just to make sure everybody is understanding this, we have the same units, most often people, that are repeatedly measured over time. So it's the same people repeatedly measured over time. I'll refer to that as either longitudinal or panel. I'll drop back and forth between those. So we've gone from a situation of it being fairly rare to have these type of data sets to now we have a fair number of them. And what this has done is it's heightened interest in how do we select the best methods to, uh, to analyze these. Now, if we just have two waves of data, if we just have people measured at two points in time, our choices are fairly restricted. But when we have five or more waves of data, which is becoming more common, we have lots of options. And in uh, an ideal world, we would go to the subject matter literature and it would tell us, well, use this model. This is the process that's operating. You know, this is what you should do. But that's not where we live. In the real world, you're really left out there. A researcher is left there to choose what he or she will apply to the data. Often what this will do it will follow the tradition in a particular field, what the people have done prior to, uh, to them. Um, without really exploring whether there are better longitudinal models that they could fit, that are uh, more general than, um, uh, than the restrictive form that they've looked at. So this uh, talk builds on some earlier work with a colleague of mine at uh, UNC, Patrick Curran, where we developed what was called the autoregressive latent trajectory model. And what this model did is it combined a autoregressive uh, process. So, uh, autoregressive for a repeated measure, where the best predictor of the current measure is the prior value, which is used to model a fair amount of data, with another different approach to longitudinal data, which are growth curve models. And these growth curve models, what they do is they allow each person in the sample to have a different starting point and a different rate of change. So you'll see people taking the identical longitudinal data set. One group might be doing an autoregressive type model. Another might be doing a growth curve. And so what this does is it combines both of those as an empirical device to see if one fits better than the other or if you need features of both of these models. So what we're doing is we're trying to generalize that model to what we call the latent variable alt model. And um, we see this as one way that if you do have that fortunate situation where you have guidance that says try this model, you could try it out and see how well it fits compared to a more general form of the model. Or you can just take a more empirical approach to try a variety of models to see which best fits your data. Now, this is a slide gives some of the basics of the model. And let me just take a moment or two to go over it. Um, the subscripting system is such that the I is indexing the person in the sample. The J is indexing which indicator of a latent variable. So what we're doing is we're, this first equation up here, this is building the relationship between latent variables and the measures you have of those latent variables. 
So if you have five different measures of the systolic blood pressure of somebody, right, those five measures would be related to the latent blood pressure, which is the blood pressure free of any type of measurement error. So in this general model, you can have any number of measures of the same latent variable, and you can estimate that relationship using that first equation. So the mu term there is giving you the item and time-specific intercept for that measure. The lambda jt, you could interpret as a factor loading if you're um, uh, used to the factor analysis tradition. And the eta it, this is the time-dependent latent variable. So it's purified of the measurement error in it. So the model allows you to have these multiple measures with the latent variable. And then in this next equation, what we're doing is we're saying, all right, what is determining the latent variable? What's influencing that latent variable? For that equation, we have this mu um, sub a to t. This is the time-specific intercept for that latent variable. The alpha i is a random intercept. So it allows uh, people to have different starting points. The lambda 2t times beta i, the beta i is giving the rate of change in a growth curve type situation. And it's allowing that growth curve factor to have a different impact on the latent variable depending on the time period. Most often in growth curve models, that's, that uh, lambda 2t is automatically assumed just to be a 1. So there's nothing in front of it. Add to that now, the next term is this rho t, t minus 1 times eta i, t minus 1. This is the autoregressive term. So in addition to the growth curve that's going on, we're allowing there to be an effect of the prior variable, the prior latent variable, on the current latent variable. That gamma xt, xit, this is an observed variable. We're assuming there's negligible measurement error in it. It's a time-varying variable that has an impact on that latent variable, eta it. And then the zi ter term there, the zi is a time-invariant observed variable that's having some impact on that latent variable. And then finally, the zeta is the error term, a stochastic error term for any other uh, influences on that variable. So let's take a look at two different ways we could approach this. Um, what I have here, these two graphs uh, are called path diagrams, something developed going on a century now uh, by Sewell Wright. Um, and what it is is a picture representation of a system of equations. And so it's the same equations we saw on that other diagram, but now put in a graph or a, uh, a picture of it. And there's two different ways we could represent this model. The one to your left, the way we handle that initial value, this eta i1. So this is the first wave of the latent variable, so the first time we measure it. We're just allowing it to correlate with the random intercept, the random starting point for people, and the random slope. Again, the slope is allowed to differ for each individual. And we have an autoregressive relationship among these latent variables. And we also have these latent variables influenced by the random intercept and the random slope. This is one way that we could represent this latent variable alt model. I should add that in this uh, case, to simplify things, I'm just showing a single measure for that latent variable at each point in time. The equation form that I showed you would allow there to be multiple measures for each point in time. Another way that we could represent the model treats this eta i1 as a function of the random intercept as well as the um, random slope variable. So uh, in the terminology that's common in the social sciences, uh, this has now become a, an endogenous variable, something that's determined by other variables in the system, whereas over here we treated it as a predetermined uh, exogenous variables. These two forms of the latent variable alt model are empirically indistinguishable. If you fit one form or the other form, you would get identical uh, likelihood function for it. You'd get identical measures of uh, fit for them. So there's no statistical empirical way to distinguish between them. I'm presenting both of them because depending on the model we want to specialize to, one of these forms or the others is easier to have as a starting point. 
So that's why I wanted to, um, to do that, and also just to show you what this would look like in a path diagram notation. All right, identification issue. This identification, again, is a question of whether it is even possible to find estimates of the parameters. If you were given population information, could you get the parameters from it? Um, we, um, in general, complicated models like this with latent variables, multiple indicators, all this other longitudinal stuff going on, there's not off-the-shelf simple ways of identifying these models that are general, necessary, and sufficient conditions. However, there is a sufficient condition that I'm outlining on this slide that you could use to show conditions you would need to identify. Um, I'm not going to take too much time on that other than to just uh, mention that, that we can impose some restrictions that are not too bad to identify that model. Um, what I showed you in the prior equations was for a single latent variable over time. Now suppose that you had multiple latent variables that also were influencing that latent variable of focus. So it's just a further generalization of what I um, had before. We now have Multiple latent variables with multiple indicators. The same indicator could be a measure of different latent variables if you wanted. This is extremely general. Now the equation in the middle of this slide has changed in that I'm introducing the possibility that other latent variables, other latent variables might influence um, additional latent variables in this model. We didn't have all we had was the autoregressive before. Now I'm allowing other latent variables to also influence it. So I think this probably gives you a sense that we're dealing with an extremely general type of structure here. Now what are some restrictive forms of this general latent variable alt model? Oh, I'm sorry, yes. I'm sorry, which term? The ZIK? The, this is time, uh, this is, will, can differ at different time points and can differ for different latent variables, but for a given time point and for a given latent variable, it, it's constant. ZIK is a time, um, time invariant covariate. Uh, it is not a, um, it is a random variable. We can consider it as a random variable, but it is, remains the same for a given individual over time and for a given latent variable. Let me, let me show you some of the special forms that I'm hoping that might help, okay? Ah, this, I'm sorry, the, um, sure, that's, that's simple the answer. Uh, the zeta, the zeta is assumed to be uncorrelated with the right-hand side variables. So we're assuming that the zeta, which is the error term, is uncorrelated with it. For identification purposes, we do have to make some restrictions on zik with respect to the uh, alpha ik in order to identify the model. And we'll see some special cases where that occurs. OK. So here are some special cases. So I mentioned very briefly the classical alt model. We could get from that general model to this classical alt model by imposing this series of restrictions. We make the intercept for the yt 0. We make the intercepts for the eta t 0. We make the gamma x t 0. We make the gamma z t 0. We end up with that classical alt model. Uh, this freed loading model, this is a, a form of um, a growth curve model that is not treated in the traditional growth curve literature, but does appear in the social behavioral sciences where you give added flexibility to the shape of the trajectory over time. Um, the linear latent growth model, so or the growth curve model, um, if you've seen this in biostatistics or others, we can get that by saying that mu yt0, mu eta t0, 
the autoregressive coefficient is zero, the gamma xt is zero, the gamma zt is zero, uh, lambda 1, 1 is one, and lambda 2t is t minus one for all t. So if you do all of that, you have that restrictive form of the general model, you get to what people are doing when they estimate a growth curve model. Um, there's a general panel model, uh, which you'll be less familiar with, but you've, um, this may get to that earlier question. The classical random effects model that's used in um, uh, st some in statistics, some in econometric social sciences, this is equivalent to imposing all of these restrictions with the additional assumption that the covariance of xt and that alpha i is, uh, is zero. And the fixed effect model is equivalent to the general model with all of these restrictions and assuming there's no time invariant z variable in the model because that's what leads to under identification. So this is just a sample of some of um, the models that are used quite frequently in the literature that can be seen as restricted and therefore nested cases of the general model. And you can do some testing to see if one of these models, like a growth curve model, fits as well or better than that more general model, the latent variable alt model. I should have added um, two on this one. This is when we treat that eta i1 as dependent on the alpha i. I said that a few slides ago that there are two different ways you could approach this. This is approaching it where that eta i1 is endogenous. If we look at the other model where the eta i1 is predetermined, that was another one of the path diagrams. You can get to many of those same models, uh, but some additional ones. You could get to a quadratic latent growth curve model um, by imposing this set of restrictions. And you could get to what's called a latent dual change score model by this. So what we see as the advantage of, um, of this general model is, again, we've got a nested structure. So we can do, if we're doing it with likelihoods, you know, maximum likelihood, we can do nested tests to see whether the model you've chosen has some, uh, is as good as some alternatives that might be out there that don't impose the same restrictions. Here's an empirical example. This is the, uh, a data set that's been analyzed in a number of other studies. It's looking at the impact of being a member of a union on wages using data from the National Longitudinal Survey of Youth. There's 545 subjects or individuals who were followed over time, and it's uh, looking at it annually from 1980 to 87. The dependent variable is the natural log of hourly wages. Independent variable is whether the wage is selected by collective bargain, so that's the union variable. The effect of being black, of the years of schooling attained, and occupational status. And so the fitted models are the fixed and random effects models, which are, are quite common. And this is a um, comparison between the different uh, possible, we actually looked at a number of models, but this is a comparison of four of those uh, models. Most common in those other treatments has been the fixed effect model and the random effect model. Here's the log likelihood. This is a chi-square test comparing the fit of this model against a saturated model that has as many parameters as there are variances, covariances, and means. These are some other measures of uh, the overall fit of the model. In comparison, we have two different forms of the latent variable alt model. And we can see, um, if, if you prefer, the BIC may be more uh, familiar to individuals here. We can see that the BICs are a much better fit for these two different forms of the latent variable alt model compared to these one, uh, fixed effect and random effects models that are used. Now, the particular form of the latent variable alt used here is the nonlinear uh, latent growth curve. So we're allowing a nonlinear growth over time, time varying autoregressive parameters, and homoscedastic errors, and time invariant covariate coefficients. The second one is the same, but we assume a linear latent growth component. These are coefficients that are coming from it. This set of coefficients here is allowing for nonlinearity in the growth curve trajectory. This is in comparison to just assuming there's a linear growth. 
Um, the coefficient that we were emphasizing here is the uh, effect of unions. And we can see that there's some variability, though the standard errors are fairly uh, uh, large on this. So um, in conclusion, you know, we have statisticians from a lot of different disciplines that have proposed many models for longitudinal data. They appear to be very different. You know, if you compare a growth curve to a random effects model or a, a fixed effects model, you would see these as ones that appear to be totally different. What we've done is we've, you know, developed a general structure so that you can see those models as just special cases of a more general possible longitudinal model. Now, further research in a number of areas. One is, um, what do we do if we have observed variables, variables in our data set that are categorical, dichotomous, ordinal, or otherwise non-continuous? Uh, we were, are working on extensions of that, uh, but what I presented here was the version of it when we have variables that are approximating continuous variables. So I would welcome uh, any questions. That's all I have at this point. Uh, questions for Ken? All right, so all right, one thing that is a concern with models like this, and uh, your question gives me a chance to emphasize this, the disturbance term, the zeta, we are assuming is not autocorrelated uh, over time. If that was autocorrelated over time, uh, we would have to build that into the model because it would bias all of the coefficients. Now, you um, probably are used to approaching data like this in the long form. Do you know that expression, long versus wide form of data? where you stack all the things on top of each other. In this structural equation modeling approach, we do wide data. And by so doing, we're not facing that same uh, uh, problem that you're describing, because it's conditional on each of these time points that we're doing with all the data spread out like this. If that helps. So any other questions? If not, let's thank the speaker.